You know, I've always had a thing for visiting old homes and gardens. There's something intriguing and mysterious about them. In today's show, we'll visit a fantastic pre-Civil War plantation that's well-rooted in the history of thoroughbred horse racing. And today, well, it's a beautiful venue for weddings and receptions. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. On a recent trip to Nashville, Tennessee, I had the great pleasure of visiting Bellmead Plantation. It's a handsome house in the Greek Revival style, but that's not the way this grand estate began. We'll hear about its humble beginnings, the ties to thoroughbred racing, and get a fantastic recipe straight from the plantation kitchen. We'll also learn why this woman worked to make the gardens at Bellmead an inviting place for brides. I even want to show you some of the vegetables I'm growing in my garden this year give you some tips on caring for them so you can make produce a colorful part of your garden. Speaking of color, I'll touch on these wonderful old-fashioned hollyhocks. So stick around, we're off to Nashville right after the break. Looking at this grand facade, it's hard to believe that the original structure on this estate was a simple log cabin, but that was the case with so many similar properties. Norman Burns spoke with us about the estate's history. When you're walking around the property today and you actually go up to the Harding Cabin, if you stand on the front porch of the Harding Cabin and look across the, the grassy area, the tree area, uh, all the way back to Bellmead Mansion, that at one time was just an open grassy meadow. Bellmead is French for beautiful meadows, so it's been known as Bellmead since 1820. Uh, the mansion building was built by William Giles Harding uh, in 1853, a home in the Greek Revival style. They had quarries on the property, so all of the limestone and sandstone that you see was all quarried here on the property. After the war, William Giles Harding concentrated very much on the thoroughbred industry. By 1867, they had their first yearling sale here at Bellmead, and that became an annual event which uh, wound up netting them a great fortune. And one of the great horses of Bellmead uh, was a horse by the name of Bonnie Scotland. Bonnie Scotland's importance to Bellmead can not only be seen at the time, but also going through today. An example of that is uh, in this year's Kentucky Derby, every horse in the field of 20 has a connection uh, to either Bonnie Scotland or another horse here at Bellmead Plantation through the bloodlines. Thoroughbreds at Bellmead, even though we no longer have them here on the property, our heritage and the bloodlines are still alive today all across America and really all across the world. It's not just the fascinating history of this plantation that attracts visitors. Pat Bullard designed a garden that's very much a part of this plantation's future. She's a driving force for what is now known as the Wedding Garden. Here's Pat to tell us more about this special place. This garden was designed originally in 1950. When I came here, the garden had been neglected for a long time. So the bones of it, of the boxwood, the magnolia, the formality of it, was there for me to work with. I think the most important part, though, was that we were trying to make this garden uh, true to a period. And we used the period of the late 19th century as being the period we would work toward with the plants. Designing a public garden is quite different than designing a private garden. I didn't know that when I started this because this was my first public experience. So function was the most important thing other than history. And the people who take care of the weddings here told me that they wanted the garden to have a white backdrop so that the brides could bring in their own special interpretations for their weddings. One day I came in here in July and there was a bride getting having her wedding portrait taken and she was laid on the grass right in front of the Becky Daisies. <laughs> and I knew I'd really done something great when a bride will lie down on the ground before her wedding in her wedding dress to be at the same level as the flowers. The gardens of Bellmead abound with history. Now after the break, I'll tell you about my own vegetable garden, inspired by historic property near our nation's capital. So don't go away. Great tips are coming up for your vegetable garden. 
Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. Just before the break, we went to Bellmead Plantation where we learned about the history of the queen of the Tennessee plantations. Old plantations like this are full of history. And as we learned by visiting with Pat Bullard, they have an exciting future. Pat is helping to keep Bellmead beautiful for brides with the addition of the wedding garden. Now, if you're like me and are just naturally drawn to old houses and gardens, then I bet you have an interest in historic plants. Take, for instance, these old-fashioned hollyhocks. Now, I've grown lots of varieties of hollyhocks in my garden over the years. For instance, take a look at this black one. It's actually grown by Thomas Jefferson in Monticello in the 18th century. The old-fashioned hollyhock is originally from China and was first recorded in England as early as the 1440s. They're part of a larger family, which includes the Malvas, like this little charmer called Malva Sylvestris Zabrina. Now don't get hung up on the name, just remember Zabrina. It's a great little mainstay in my garden, and I'm sure it's one you'll want to include in yours. For years, I've grown Zabrina in the front borders of my garden. Its striped blooms harmonize beautifully with many of the other flowers and foliage in this area. One aspect of this plant that I really like is that it reseeds itself freely and will bloom right up until the last frost in the fall. Now let's move over to the vegetable garden. Let me show you some beautiful and functional trees. In my vegetable garden, I make it a point to mix herbs and flowers along with the produce for a fantastic, colorful display. And the colors of the plants themselves often inspire me both in the garden and in the kitchen. Take, for instance, these little tomatoes. They're called pear tomatoes, and I love their sweet flavor and color. They're almost like little light bulbs in the garden. I also like using the fun Medusa peppers because of their showy fruit set. Now another addition to consider is shard. Just take a look at the array of color you can find in the stems of this plant. And don't forget about lettuces. Just look at how leafy and blousy these look in the garden. And of course you can't forget about herbs. Mints and basils are especially good for colors. There's so many different varieties of basil. This is the common or sweet basil. It's one of the most popular because it produces lots of tasty leaves, ideal for tomato sauces and pesto. Take a look at this purple basil. It would make a beautiful addition to any flower garden. And this small leafed basil is called spicy globe. Its tight, compact form makes it perfect for the small garden or as a border plant. And take a look at this big leaf basil. This one's called Valentino. Now, basil is an annual herb. It's easy to grow. All you need is full sun and warm temperatures. Now, I'm planting transplants, but it's easily grown directly from seed. Now, as the plants mature, they'll begin to bloom. But I found that basil seems to taste better if you harvest it before it produces flowers. So keep the tops pinched out of the stems and remove any signs of flower spikes. Now, if you think you have to have a property the size of Bell Mead to have a suitable kitchen garden, think again. Containers make ideal gardens. They're great for growing spring crops like lettuces, ideal for some of those peppers I mentioned earlier. Herbs are great performers in containers. Why, well, I've even created what I call a pizza pot. It's a great way to get children involved in the garden by planting many of the herbs and vegetables that go into making one of their all-time favorite dishes, pizza. So if you've been inspired by the colorful vegetables and herbs you've seen, then don't be afraid to give them a try. I always enjoy answering viewer questions from viewers such as yourself. And today we get a question from Helen in Fredona, New York. She's interested in growing some beautiful window boxes this year and wonders if I have any tips that will help her have a successful season. Well, I certainly do. Now, when you create a window box, you want to start with a good soil. Don't use the soil that you used last year and certainly don't dig something up out of the backyard and expect your plants to flourish. You want a potting soil that's loose and designed for a container garden. Now, one of the other things that I do, Helen, is I always mix in a water retentive polymer in the soil. This helps retain moisture. That's going to be one of your biggest challenges. Now, just a little bit of this polymer goes a long way, so follow the directions on the label. Now, when it comes to fertilization, I use a slow release fertilizer that I mix into the soil before I plant. And then throughout the growing season, I fertilize regularly with an all purpose liquid fertilizer. Okay, now for the fun part, choosing plants for your window boxes. Now remember, if you've got a full sun situation, and you're not going to be particularly attentive to keeping the soil moist, 
you may want to go with plants that are drought tolerant, plants that can take a little neglect. Look into the sedums. There's so many wonderful textures and colors. And if you want flowers, you might go for this little guy. This is fanflower or scovola. Purple fan is an excellent bloomer. This plant is originally from Australia. It can almost completely dry out and then rehydrate upon watering. It's beautiful as it cascades out of containers. Now, if you're going to be more regular with your watering, there's a wider range of plants you can consider like these wonderful old-fashioned petunias. Just look at this bloom. This one's called ultraviolet, and it has a wonderful fragrance. And it's a great performer. It'll bloom from spring until fall. Now, Helen, when I think of some of the most beautiful plants for window boxes, it's usually those that spill or cascade over the edge with abundance. Some other examples would be trailing coleus, sweet potato vine, trailing geraniums, verbena, and for a shady location, you might try this variegated ivy. I created this container after being inspired by a blooming Japanese iris in my shade garden. You see, it contains three containers with plants such as impatience, heuchera, lamium, and cordyline. Let's take a look at a few of these. You know, I enjoy using supersonic impatience in the shade garden for a big burst of color. These are supersonic lavender. I've also used extreme pink impatience from the flower fields in this composition. A plant that's really catching on in shade gardens is heuchera, or commonly known as coral bells. This one's called silver load and it really stands out. Just look at these amazing leaves. I love using the tall and spiky red cordyline. This one's called red sensation in container combinations. It's hard to beat with that deep burgundy foliage. Now this is lamium and it's a variety called pink pewter and it complements the container I've placed them in. Just look at the combination of bloom and foliage. I think they really are beautiful together. And doesn't extreme pink impatience go well with the pink pewter lamium? For more container combinations, you can visit my website, that's pallensmith.com, where you can sign up for my free weekly newsletter, which contains a sampling of viewer questions and answers. After the break, we'll go back to vegetables and I'll show you another way to grow fresh produce. And it was inspired by a visit to a very historic garden. So don't go away. Just look at these dazzling flowers. I just love the color combination of this soft yellow and soft orange. These are Cape daisies or osteospermums and they come from the Crescendo series. Now what's interesting about this plant is they'll take high temperatures, but they need dry air. So they're perfect for parts of California and in the Rocky Mountains. Not a particularly good plant for the south or areas where you have high humidity. I love osteospermums in big banks or drifts and in containers. A vegetable garden may not sound inspiring, but for me, I look for ideas in every hidden corner of a garden, including the vegetable garden. You know, over the years, I've had the great pleasure and opportunity to see a lot of grand estates, and there was one vegetable garden in particular that stuck in my mind. In fact, I drew inspiration from it for my own garden. It was on a visit to Mount Vernon, the home of our nation's first president, George Washington, and his wife, Martha. Mount Vernon is located just outside Washington, D.C. in Virginia, and the father of our country played an intricate role in designing and developing the grounds around his home. It was the vegetable garden that caught my eye with its geometric patterns and design. Everything was so neatly laid out, and yet within each bed, a picture was created. I took inspiration from Mount Vernon when I decided to create my own tiny vegetable garden. You see, I created a series of raised beds on each side of my tool shed. A rustic lattice screen runs across the back, providing a decorative support for climbing vines. It's a simple plant, but one that works to bring color, life, and order to my vegetable garden. Now, over the years, I've fallen away from strictly using my vegetable garden for produce. You see, I look for every opportunity I can to fill it in with lots of beautiful, colorful annuals. And in the fall, I pack in lots of tulips and other bulbs, so in the spring, I have a riot of color. I use them to border the raised beds and I actually grow lots of tulips in containers. You know what I always say, when it comes to mixing and matching in the garden, just let your imagination be your guide. Just like in the kitchen, 
After the break, we're going back to Belle Mead for a fantastic recipe straight from the plantation chef. So don't go away. You know, I really enjoy collecting recipes from all of my travels. And while I was at Belle Mead, I stopped by the kitchen at the plantation to see Chef Martha Stamps. Okay, this is one of my favorite salads. It's a cracked wheat salad. Cracked wheat you may have heard of as tabbouleh. And these are our vegetables. You can see the shredded carrots. These are the radishes, which I love. They give it a real um, crunchy zing, too. They've got a great flavor. And these are beets, which are one of my very favorite vegetables. And they're shredded raw, which is so great for you. And they make it a beautiful color. This is shredded cucumber. I like to peel it and take the seeds out first. And then we've got some great fresh herbs. This is fresh mint, which smells wonderful. And I grow it in my garden, and it's all come up, and it looks beautiful right now. And this is cilantro, which is also awesome. And flat leaf parsley, which I think is really underused and is one of my favorite herbs. This is about two cloves of garlic that are chopped and the juice of four lemons, which makes it really zingy, and just a little salt, and I use coarse salt. I like the way it tastes and the way it dissolves, and some um, freshly cracked pepper, and a little bit of olive oil right here. Okay, we're gonna start to put this together, and it goes really quickly. Stir all these together, and you'll see what a beautiful color this turns out. It's really stunning if you do it on a buffet. I like to serve this with either some fresh seared salmon or roasted lamb. So there you have it. This is our um, cracked wheat salad. I think you'll really love it. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. You know, I enjoy so much traveling around the country and finding ideas and great tasting recipes to share with you, just like that recipe for Martha. Now, if you missed anything in today's show, you can always go to my website, pallensmith.com, to find it. It's all there. Until next time, get out there and grow something. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile